Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank the organizers, uh, Professor Bono, Professor Jakub, to invite me to this meeting. Uh, it's a beautiful weather outside. It's like a paradise coming from London. Uh, anyway, let's move on with the uh, topic. So, uh, it, it's, uh, so we're moving away from the coronary arteries and looking at microcirculation. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, data uh, looking at uh, patients who, on angiography, did not demonstrate any coronary artery disease. But what you find is, in this various clinical scenario of acute myocardial, myocardial infarction with ST elevation, myocardial infarction with no ST elevation, in unstable angina, that there is uh, a prevalence uh, in terms of clinical presentations of major cardiac adverse events of 6 to 8 percent, going up to nearly 30 percent in this group of patients who do not have coronary artery disease on coronary angiography, and which suggests that there's something else is going on beyond uh, coronary artery vessels. Now, this is another data from the Courage study where they looked at um, a prevalence of angina uh, uh, both during uh, uh, coronary angioplasty with medical therapy and with medical therapy. At baseline, as you can see, the prevalence was pretty high, but at one year, though it dropped to 34%, yet there's a fair number of patients still complaining of angina. And if you look at the PCI versus the medical treatment, though the PCI had lower prevalence of angina, but at five years, they equalized with medical therapy, suggesting that again, that it's not really the coronary arteries which is responsible for some of the symptoms that the patient present with, but something quite beyond that. Now, this is a very impressive data uh, uh, from a, a group from Copenhagen, where they looked at a large group of patients. Uh, first of all, they looked at the symptomatic group, uh, asymptomatic group in terms of survival. And then they looked at patients with and without coronary artery disease. And what is very impressive is that if you look at this data, those without coronary artery disease or with non-obstructive coronary artery disease still have high event rates compared to those who do have coronary artery disease. So they almost merge with each other, again suggesting that we have to now look beyond what we see in the coronary arteries and that, I think, brings back to this debate of looking at functional imaging versus anatomical imaging uh, only, or maybe both, looking at both together. So there's a paradigm shift now. So patients coming in with chest pain, there is, if you demonstrate myocardial ischemia by any technique, the patient may not have coronary artery disease, but may have other reasons for having myocardial ischemia. And one of them, of course, is microvascular dysfunction, which has been shown to predict outcome, uh, even in absence of coronary artery disease. Now, so what is this microvascular vasculature we are talking about? So this is a cast looking at coronary artery and the vasculature. So myocardial vasculature is that proportion of coronary blood volume which is contained within the myocardium, consisting of arterioles, capillaries, and venules, of which 90% is actually in the capillaries. So one third or even more, 40% of the myocardial blood volume is actually the capillaries. Now, so how can you see the capillaries? So because if you're talking about microcirculation, let's look at the capillaries because that's where the microcirculation is. So this is a technique called myocardial contrast echocardiography. And what you see here now is a video image of capillaries. These are real capillaries that you're seeing. And within the capillaries, the smaller bubbles are the red blood cells. And the slightly larger, uh, the larger image that you see are the micro bubbles injected during echocardiography. And you can actually image those bubbles within the capillaries with echocardiography. Now, we know the capillaries as structures that provide nutrients, that provide oxygen. But capillaries are much more than that. In fact, they work in conjunction with coronary arteries. So this is a very interesting data from the University of Virginia, from Professor Call's group, where they looked at resistances at the stenosis level, at the arteriolar level, 
at the capillary level and at the venular level. So they looked at resistances that, is, that it offers uh, during each of these, uh, in each of these anatomical areas. Now, I don't, want you to, I don't want to go through all of that, but if you just look at this uh, bar here, the red bar, which says rest, and this is looking at resistances uh, at the stenosis level, at the arterial level, at the capillary level, at the venular level, and if you look at just at rest, where nothing is given, the patient is resting, what you see here is the resistance that is offered to the myocardial blood, to the blood flow within the myocardium are the arterioles. They provide the greatest resistance to the flow of blood through the capillaries, uh, into the myocardium, etc. However, if you look at the last blue slide, the blue uh, bar here, which is the patient has stenosis. Now, this is an experimental data, but I'm just translating that into patients. The, uh, uh, it has stenosis, and the patient is exercising. You will see that the, the resistance now from the arterial has dropped remarkably. It's gone right down. Now, what is offering the resistance to the blood flow are the capillaries. So the capillaries are now providing the greatest resistance to myocardial blood flow, though we, knew, though we know that the capillaries do not have any smooth muscle. So how can they suddenly increase the resistance? Now, the manner in which they do it is by de-recruitment. So this is, an, this is the example of hyperemia with stenosis, where there is uh, the, uh, the resistance that is provided by the capillaries is the highest, and you can see the number of capillaries has gone down. So it's de-recruitment of capillaries. So the capillaries actually actively recruit and de-recruit to maintain this mean pressure of 30 millimeter within the capillaries. If it exceeds more than 30, the capillary is going to burst. If it's less than 30, there will not be enough nutrients. So the capillaries are very active in providing protection to the myocardium. And this actually is translated into what we see clinically in patients with stenosis, uh, so if you look at, if, if, this, is, this is looking at the myocardium and looking at the, myocardial, uh, the microcirculation here or the capillaries here, you can see the capillaries, the capillary volume diminishes with increasing level of stenosis and also the blood flow velocity also diminishes with increasing level of stenosis. And that is the reason why you see defects on SPECT uh, when patients have stenosis. And that's why you see defects on myocardial contrast echocardiography when the patient has stenosis. And that's why you see defects on MRI when you give adenosine when, when they have stenosis. But what SPECT cannot look at is the temporal uh, part of the whole situation. That is the way the, blood, uh, the velocity is also reduced. And that is the advantage of myocardial contrast echocardiography because it has both the temporal and the spatial resolution to look at both. So this is an example of a patient with myocardial contrast echocardiography where the contrast is infused through a pump. So a steady state is maintained in the whole of the body. And, and at that point, if you put a region of interest in anywhere on the myocardium, you get the relative capillary blood volume. And then all you need to do is to get rid of the microbubbles by, and the microbubbles interact with ultrasound. As the ultrasound uh, mechanical index or the power goes up, the microbubbles get destroyed. And then you see it watching and just look at it coming back again into the myocardium, and that gives you the velocity. So this is a technique that can look at capillary blood volume and myocardial blood velocity at the same time, the product of which is myocardial blood flow, or rather capillary blood flow, because that's what we are looking at here. So, so this is how it can be quantitated. Now you can look at it, you can quantitate it. So this is what I've just shown you, the flash, meaning the microbials are cleared, and you put regions of interest in anywhere near the myocardium, on the myocardium in fact, and then this is an example here. So you see the flash coming up there, and then you see the, uh, the, uh, the microbials coming back into the myocardium, and then you plot this against time. So this is time here, and this is the myocardial blood volume. This is the plateau of it, and that's the velocity, and that's at rest. So you get the velocity here, you get the capillary blood volume, which is A, and the combination or the product of that is the myocardial blood flow at rest. Now there is an exponential curve that it fits into, and that gives you the myocardial blood flow at rest. And you can do that 
when the patient is stressed. And here you can see the myocardial blood velocity has gone up. The capillary blood volume has remained the same depending on the amount of myocardial oxygen consumption. And then you have the myocardial blood flow at peak. And the ratio of the myocardial blood flow at peak and that of the resting myocardial blood flow gives you the myocardial blood flow reserve or the coronary flow reserve as you know it. And this is a data looking at the, uh, uh, comparing with myocardial blood flow with PET in quite, in about 50, more than 50 patients, but looking at several data points uh, at rest and during hyperemia. And you can see here, it's a very good agreement between myocardial blood flow seen by myocardial contrast echocardiography, which can be performed at the bedside along, and this is with PET. And we know from this slide, I'm, I'm sure everybody has seen it many, many times, that when the when the, uh, when the coronary stenosis exceeds more than 50%, the coronary flow reserve drops. And this is a study in humans that was done, which showed exactly that with myocardial contrast echocardiography, that looking at coronary flow reserve, or we call it beta reserve, you can see there's a drop in the beta reserve after 50% stenosis, exactly replicating what you see uh, uh, in, in experimental models. Now, this is our study that we did in patients coming in with acute heart failure with no previous diagnosis of coronary artery disease and therefore we have we imaged them as soon as the patient came in did the echo did the myocardial contrast echocardiography and we looked at coronary flow reserve and you can see that the coronary flow reserve is not normal in such patients without stenosis about 2.5 but with increasing stenosis it drops uh, to a remarkably low degree so there is a relationship between coronary flow reserve and coronary stenosis, as you can see here. Now, this is looking at outcome of these patients. And you can see that though some of the patients didn't have coronary flow, uh, didn't have coronary stenosis, yet the outcome if the coronary flow reserve is less than 1.5 is not good compared to those who have coronary flow reserve more than 5. So now, so again, this is beyond coronary artery disease. So even if the patient didn't have coronary artery disease, if the coronary flow reserve is less than 1.5, then the outcome is not good. So this is a case report I'm just presenting, and this has just been, uh, 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 you can see it's just been accepted for publication, but it's an interesting study that I did with uh, Professor Sectum in Stuttgart, where he said, why don't you come over, let's do some myocardial contrast and look at the microcirculation. So this, so he, he, he's got this patient, 77 years female, who had exertional shortness of breath and chest pain, and has cardiovascular risk factors. Now, excise ECG, et cetera, didn't show any ECG changes. Coronary angiography showed a 50% distal left circumflex and minor irregularity of the coronary artery. But the patient was complaining of quite a lot of pain. And this is an angiogram just for, you know, record here. You can see a little bit of lesion here. Now, what he does is he gives acetylcholine to look at vasoreactivity. Both of the micro, uh, both of, and the acetylcholine acts both on the coronary vasculature and also on the myocardial uh, microcirculation. So this is, sorry. I was trying to, yeah, okay. So here you can see this is a, a contrast echocardiography at rest, looking at wall motion. You can see that the wall motion is completely normal. So I'm imaging the patient while he's doing the cat. So the patient is on the cat table. And you can see it's, it's a completely normal wall motion at this point. And this is myocardial uh, perfusion here. Again, the typical flash replenishment imaging that you see that we do here. You can see the flash coming up. And if you look at the, it, it filling, it's filling up very, very quickly in all these areas here. Now, so acetylcholine is injected and the patient started complaining of chest pain. And the patient was asked, is this the type of chest pain that you get in day-to-day -day activity? The patient said, yes, that's exactly what I get. But when they looked at the coronary arteries, nothing was happening to the coronary arteries. There's no change on the coronary arteries. The ECGs were practically normal, maybe showing a little bit of ST changes. But when we did the contrast, now you can clearly see wall motion abnormality and a huge perfusion defect. Now, this patient, this patient had just minor coronary artery disease. So this is an example where the coronary microcirculation is affected, and that's giving rise to the chest pain to this patient. Now, this is another very interesting example from actually uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Professor Yakub's patient who referred the patient to me very kindly, saying that, you know, can you deal with this patient because I don't know what's going on with this. So, 72-year-old, very active and successful businessman, 
shortness of breath on exertion, hypertensive, had a stent in LAD, but he continued to complain of the shortness of breath. Now, a coronary angiography was done, which said query instant stenosis. There was a query ischemia on the nuclear scan, and it, the patient was restented, but the symptoms persisted. The patient still had breathlessness on exertion, no chest pain, just breathlessness on exertion. So what I first did is I did an exercise echo, which is an excellent technique to bring out symptoms. So the patient was complaining of shortness of breath, and if you look at the, so this is at rest, this is on stress, and if you look at the uh, echo here, the wall, uh, the wall thickness had improved, the LV volume has gone down, there's no way this patient is complaining of chest pain because of coronary disease, because there's no wall motion abnormality, and the patient is extremely breathless. So we did myocardial contrast echo, and we calculated the coronary flow reserve. You can see there's no defect there, but what you can see is a slow filling of the myocardium with the microbubbles, and we calculated the coronary flow reserve, it was down to two. And it's definitely below normal. And when we, when, and during exercise, when we assessed his LV filling pressure, it shot up. So the reason for this patient getting shortness of breath is because the patient's got mild LVH, the patient has got increase in LV filling pressure on exercise, and that's because the coronary flow reserve is reduced. So this patient didn't actually need any coronary artery intervention any further. And um, uh, six months later, he wrote to me and said, I'm feeling much better on the medication of control of blood pressure, but after that, I think Professor Yakub will tell me how he's doing. I haven't followed him up since. I'm sure you have. So now, use of this technique to look at microcirculation. So we looked at another group of patients, uh, that is patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Uh, we know that acute hypoglycemia has, had a, has a bad outcome. It's, it's, it has worse outcome than hyperglycemia. Now, why is it so? Why is a patient with acute hypoglycemia should have a bad outcome? It's not only that they drop you know, the sugar and they become, uh, they become syncopal, but they actually die of myocardial infarction sometimes, and they have, and they, they have non-ST elevation infarction during that time. So we decided to look at what's going on in the capillaries, and these patients don't have coronary disease. So now this is the data looking at baseline. So we'll, let's look, con concentrate on the diabetic population. And the baseline, and this is looking at, uh, at, the pa at patients with euglycemia. And this is hypoglycemia. And we are looking at myocardial blood flow reserve. And you can see at baseline, they're diabetic patients. The coronary flow reserve is already reduced to about 2.1, 2.2. Now, with euglycemia, the coronary flow reserve actually goes up. But with hypoglycemia, if you look at it, the coronary flow reserve has gone down again. Now, why has the coronary flow reserve gone down? You see, that is the, uh, 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 the thing that, this, that we have with this technique, that we can look at the component of coronary flow reserve, that is volume and velocity. So now when we looked, when we looked at myocardial blood flow, yes, when we looked at myocardial blood flow, you can see the hyperemic response with hypoglycemia was much less than those with euglycemic patients. Now, when, so we, we're just concentrating this diabetic group, but when we looked at myocardial blood velocity, you can see that the myocardial blood velocity has gone down quite significantly compared to euglycemic patient in parallel to reduction in myocardial blood flow reserve. But what hasn't gone down is the capillary blood volume. So the capillary blood volume never changed. It's the myocardial blood velocity that has gone down. So in, in hypoglycemia, actually there is some abnormality of the rheology of the, of the, um, of the right red blood cell. And when this was correlated to endothelin, so we also measured endothelin-1, it was highly raised in hypoglycemic patients. And as you know, endothelin-1, uh, uh, the ratio of endothelin-1 nitric, nitrous oxide suggests that there is endothelial dysfunction of patients with hypoglycemia. And this is giving rise to low velocity, but not low capillary blood volume. So the capillaries are fine. It is just the flow within the capillaries which is abnormal now. Now this is another group that we studied. We were, we, we've done a lot of studies with athletes. And, and we know that with and, and athletes with the gray zone hypertrophy of 12 to 13 millimeters, it's very difficult to distinguish between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a physiological heart. So we looked at exactly that group. And when we looked at our baseline data, looking at LV dimension, uh, LV wall thickness, 
you know, LA dimension uh, uh, and the filling pressures, etc. There's no way you can distinguish between these Your two groups is up. with this technique. Now, when we looked at Michael blood flow reserve using Michael contrast echocardiography, you can see that the Michael blood flow reserve of an athlete is about 5.5, which is super normal compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is only 2.3, which is not normal. Now, what determines this change in Michael blood flow reserve in an athlete? So we looked at again the components. So this is looking at coronary blood volume, meaning capillary, sorry, capillary blood volume. So you can see even at rest, the capillary blood volume in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the septum is reduced, which is really not unexpected because they've got fibrosis. And while you can see that those with, the, uh, uh, with athletes don't. Now, during stress, and we give vasodilator here, you can see that the capillary blood volume recruitment was extremely bad in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and extremely good in patients, in, in subjects, with, uh, 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 in athletes. So, but if you look at the velocity, there's no difference between the two groups. So in this group of patient, it is the capillary recruitment of the athletes that has, you know, that, the, that these athletes have to mount the increased myocardial blood flow reserve. And the, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's just the opposite. They don't have any capillary recruitment benefit, though the velocities they can mount. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, microcirculation is affected both in coronary artery disease and in non-CAD condition. And myocardial contrast echocardiography is a unique bedside technique that can assess microcirculation directly and can assess microcirculation volume and flow simultaneously and therefore, it has the potential to uncover the pathophysiology behind the disease process going on in the myocardium. Thank you.